Sicario is the new film directed by Denis Villeneuve, who made uh, Prisoners and uh, Enemy and uh, Incendies. And uh, it delves once again into that strange sort of Nietzschean borderland world of America's uh, war with uh, Mexican drug cartels, which we have seen told many times when you go back to, I suppose, uh, Steven Soderbergh's Traffic, which actually incidentally came from a Channel 4 series, but set somewhere else in Traffic. And then you have uh, recently we've had Cartel Land, which is an absolutely brilliant documentary, which is up for the best documentary Oscar, I hope. And I think it you know should be a strong contender. We've had this brilliant Mexican film called Heli, which kind of gets overlooked. Uh, Amos Escalante's film, which is really, really extraordinary, which is kind of looking at the the way in which this awful cultural violence uh, is impinges on the, the, the on the people's south of the border who are the real sort of victims of all this. Anyway, into all this, we have Dennis Villeneuve's uh, new, uh, new film uh, called uh, uh, Sicario, which apparently in Mexican and Spanish means um, hitman. There's been some discussion about whether or not this is a slang word. I mean, it does in Spanish, Sicario, that is what it means. So the story is that at the beginning, uh, Emily Blunt is a sort of fairly idealistic FBI agent. Uh, and we begin with the most extraordinary ram raid on what turns out to be a house of horrors. And it's one of those openings in which the film really sets out its table. It's it's a really brilliantly orchestrated sequence. The team turn up, they bust this house, they find appalling things. I mean, you think they find so much that you, th you almost think, OK, we're in a horror movie now. And Emily Blunt's character, uh, uh, Kate, decides that what she really wants to do is to really get to the heart of, you know, what's happening. She is then taken aside and apparently recruited for a very, very sort of unclear mission by people whose loyalties and indeed authority seems at very best vague. Here's a clip. State Department is pulling an agent from the field that specializes in responding to escalated cartel activity. You'll be part of the team. You meet up with him at Luke uh, tomorrow? Day after, early. Air Force Base? Yeah, we're gonna go see Guillermo. Diaz's brother. That's the one. Where is he? Oh, he's in the El Paso area. What's our objective? To dramatically overreact. Kate, you must volunteer for an interagency task force. Think very hard before you respond. You want to be a part of this? Do we get an opportunity of the men responsible for today? The men who are really responsible for today, yeah. I'll volunteer. So what then happens is that she's volunteered for an operation, which very quickly turns out is a kind of black ops operation. It's all very covert. She starts to wonder who exactly everyone is working for. Her immediate boss is a special agent by Josh Brolin, wearing, incidentally, the most ironic wearing of flip-flops in cinema this year. You know, he's wearing flip-flops, but he's not the dude. Uh, and then Benicio Del Toro's character, Alejandro, who uh, we the little that we know about him is that he used to be a prosecutor, and now we're not sure who he is or who he's working for or where he comes from or exactly what he's doing and what we're told is that what they're going to do is they're going to shake the tree they're going to shake the tree which is going to sort of cause uh, dis uh, discord in the cartel world which is going to draw out the person for whom they are looking which is Manuel Diaz who is the kind of the overseer of the current cartel and all the way through this lines of engagement i mean borders both geographical and moral and legal are crossed backwards and forwards and as the narrative goes on in a very sort of time-honored fashion we get into that area in which you know there is no black and white everything is to do with shades of gray everybody seems to be involved with everybody else nobody seems to be declaring exactly what their allegiances are and we are in a world in which it becomes very, very unclear exactly what the mission objective is. Um, there's you know, doubt about to whom does that title, that Sicario, exactly refer, because there are, in the drama, many killers, many targets, many crimes, many atrocities. Now, the fact is that that's not a new story. I mean, that is a story which has been told several times. It's becoming sort of quite a, quite a cinematic cliche, almost. What makes this work is, well, two things. Firstly, Emily Blunt's central performance is terrific. I mean, she's really, really good. I mean, arguably, Benicio Del Toro has the more eye-catching performance. He's this kind of riddle. He's this enigma. When he's, you know, when people ask what he does, even if you've seen the trailers, you'll see a lot of people saying, well, he goes where he's sent. He does what he does. And you won't understand, but that's what he does. And then, of course, you've got the, the Josh Brolin character, who is, you, you know 
on the one hand, when you first meet him, this sort of strange charisma, he's the one who says, you know, what's our objective to dramatically overreact? So those are quite big showy performances. And Emily Blunt's character has this, this, the harder role, which is going into this as the sort of slightly naive but honest person who really wants to get to the bottom of what's going on and has an, is a, in a reactive role, but also is taking part in these missions. So what I think she does brilliantly is that she's modulating between uh, front foot, back foot, between her performance being emotional and being physical, between being somebody who's at the front of all this and somebody who's playing catch up, following along with everybody else and not quite understanding the situation. She does that brilliantly. The second thing is that the film is very, very well directed and it has three or four set pieces in it that are just pure cinema. It's shot by Roger Deakins, who is overdue an Oscar, and I think that this you know, this must be the moment when the Oscar comes. Um, and it has this real sort of cinematic sense. People have referred to it as being a, a bit like Michael Mann, and I, th I mean, I understand what they mean by that. In fact, that was a comparison that initially occurred to me. But, for example... What do they mean by that? Well... There's a sort of Michael Mann is that you've seen Heat because mm -hmm. you were talking about Heat earlier on. You know the way in which Michael Mann does that kind of um, sort of semi-militarized police work that involves black cars driving through streets and everything's very choreographed. And the, you remember the, the central shootout in Heat, which everybody talked about Mann suddenly that being his kind of his great pièce de résistance, almost like the dance number in the middle of that song in which they built the they built the street two blocks either way so that they you know, had complete freedom to to. Uh, you know, to shoot. In the case of this, there is uh, there is one particular sequence, for example, in which uh, our central characters are involved in the opposite of a car chase, which is a traffic jam. And it is one, one of the tensest traffic jams I have seen. It's a traffic jam in which they are trying to get across the border and nobody is moving. And the cars on either side of them may or may not have people in them who are a danger to them, but nobody knows. But each car is inching forward just a little bit, and it's what it does is brilliantly captures that kind of paranoia. The other thing is that a lot of the entries into the scenes are shot in quite extended takes. It, they're, they're not you know, nowadays, there's a there's a lot of kind of you know everything is edited very very fast. You'll you, there's a there's a there's a technique which some uh, film teachers use, which is to get a, a class load of people to watch a film and to click their fingers. This is why I'm doing this every time there's an edit. And you do it with old films and it like that at the beginning of a dance number and then at the end there's another one you do it in modern films and you just you can't see the film anymore because it's clicking in the case of sicario it is not afraid of letting a shot stay it's not afraid of hanging on to a particular shot so that you're looking you literally start getting that looking around the corners looking feeling paranoid about you know what's happening what's coming in what am i afraid what am i frightened of what am i worried about and i think the way in which it does that visually is really gripping. So essentially, the strength of it is that it's a it's a really well made piece of filmmaking. It's not that the script itself is doing anything particularly groundbreaking on you because it isn't. What it is is it's taking a story which is I think becoming all the more familiar, but just executing it in a way which is fascinating. And it, this is particularly interesting in the case of this program because we were talking before about Suffragette, and Suffragette that story is a story which people aren't so familiar with, despite the fact that it's, you know, 100 years old. I mean, it's extraordinary that people aren't familiar with it. But, the, but what I didn't say in that review was, well, you know, the, the filmmaking is full of brio and full of verve and all the rest of it. Well, in the case of this, it is a fairly well-worn story. It's that twisty, we don't know which side of the thing we're on. It's that Nietzsche. It's quite confusing to follow. It's, it's not confusing. What it is is deliberately befuddling. I mean, you, you do follow it because, it's, you know, be, but the whole point is that you're following her character and she keeps saying, what are we doing? Where are we going? Who is he? Where, where does he come from? What are we trying to do? How are we going to get back? We're where? So her character is doing that all the way through. And it's a great, again, it's a great credit to Emily Blunt that she manages to do that and to make it that she, that her character is not just a reactive character. Her character is actually the, the driving because There's also in all the interpersonal relationships that that sense of of doubt and uncertainty they manage to preserve it enough so that you don't just think you're watching a film in which it's one of those twisty silly things in which oh you thought he was that but now he turns out to be that there's never any sense of that what it is is it's a it, it's a familiar sort of nietzschean story but told with with so much filmmaking verve that those four or five set pieces you think i, mean, I said that 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 traffic jam is the best traffic jam I've seen in a long time.